Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everybody. Glad you're all here with us this afternoon uh, for our Hutch at Home series. Today, I'm excited uh, for the talk, focusing on collaboration. So the title of this talk is Doing Science Together, a Virologist and Statistician Collaborate. We're um, very excited to have Dr. Rabia Rosenkahn and Dr. Paul Edlefson with us. I'm Jeannie Chowning. I'm the Senior Director of Science Education and Training at Fred Hutch, and I welcome you all to our session. And before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, and uh, past and present, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Feel free at this time to introduce yourself by adding your name, your role, like if you're a teacher or student, and your school or organization into the chat so we get a sense of who's here. Um, if you're comfortable, you can also turn on your video for a second and, and wave hi to our presenters so they um, can see who's in the audience, but that's not a requirement. Um, please stay muted during the presentation and um, we'll address questions during the Q&A. You can, you can put your questions into the chat, but um, we're gonna wait uh, for this particular talk until the very end um, to, to ask the questions. So um, if you could please, uh, please do that, that would be helpful. And you are welcome to sign up for our newsletter to receive news of upcoming events. And there's a QR code um, that you can scan with your phone if you'd like to fill out that that form and we'll come back to that at the end of the talk. So if you don't get it right now, uh, we can do it later. All right, and thank you, uh, Nina and Liza and that people are starting to drop their um, names into the chat. That's wonderful. It is nice to know who's here. Okay, so um, Dr. Rabia Rosenkahn is a virologist with expertise in HIV, and she's doing postdoctoral fellowship in biostatistics, working on genetic sequence analysis of HIV vaccine studies. And Dr. Edlefson is a senior staff scientist in our vaccine and infectious disease division and an affiliate assistant professor at biostatistics at the University of Washington. So really delighted to have them both with us here today. And I'm gonna stop my share now and turn it over um, to our presenters. Great, thank you, Jeannie. So uh, welcome everyone. I uh, am so pleased to be here today and I'm going to share my screen now and uh, hopefully this will work. Uh, here we go. And I think I need to put it in presenter mode. There we go. All right, so uh, Rabia, I take it away. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, it's such a pleasure to be giving a talk with you guys today. Um, and welcome, um, all of you. It's so lovely to, to have you all with us. Um, so my name is uh, Rabia Rosenkahn, as Jeannie mentioned. And today, Paul and I, who work together at the Fred Hutch in the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division, will be giving a talk on um, doing science together and um, giving you a flavor for how we collaborate in the work that we do. Next slide, please. So before I start, um, I just wanted to remind everyone, um, firstly, express our appreciation for teachers because none of us would be here without all of the wonderful teachers um, that have been a part of our journey, but also um, the fact that none, no one on this planet is like you, um, like a unique fingerprint right now at this very moment, you know, your knowledge, your experience, your way of thinking, all of these different things make you a very unique individual and your you may not realize it, but you're able to contribute in so many ways. Um, next slide, please. So I'm from two um, equally beautiful and friendly places, Botswana, a landlocked country uh, where I was born and raised, and Mauritius, a little island near Madagascar where my parents are from. Um, next slide, please. So growing up, I had a pet goat named Jacaranda. Um, 
at the start of my career, I used to be very interested in the environment and I used to study uh, degradation of uh, Mopani pods, which the which is um, a, a pod that grows um, on a Mopani tree, which the Mopani caterpillar feeds on. And this is an important source of protein um, in some parts of Botswana. And so um, funny story, I did try and eat it once. Um, no, that didn't go so well, but um, you have to try it at least once before you say you don't like it. Um, but um, next slide, please. Um, so at the time, um, HIV was becoming a very big problem in Botswana. And as you can see from the map, the prevalence rate in HIV, HIV infected uh, and pregnant uh, in HIV infected women was about 40%. And um, I felt as a scientist, as a person, I couldn't not work on HIV because it was something that I could see affecting people in my community. Um, the only problem was the University of Botswana at the time had a food option or an environmental option. And there was no pathway for me to be able to do HIV research. Um, and at the time, um, when I spoke to my head of department, he said, well, you know, I'm really sorry, Rabi, we'll have to find some other sort of like avenue because we just don't have the, 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 the opening for you to be able to do this type of research. And you won't, it, it doesn't look that way, but back then I used to be a very shy person. Um, but I thought at, in that moment, no, this is something that I really wanna do and I really need to find a way to do it. Um, next slide, please. And so um, in thinking about the, the problem more carefully, I thought of breast milk, which technically is food. And so I could potentially do HIV research, but I had no clue how I would even get um, a breast milk sample or you know, what the process would be. I knew there were ethics involved, but, and, and that I had to sort of like figure it out, but I had no clue how I was gonna be able to do this. Um, but at the time I met um, an amazing scientist and teacher, um, Professor Thumbi Ndungu, who is pictured uh, here. And he, till today he laughs at me at scientific conferences because I remember he says, when I asked him this question, I didn't make eye contact. I was super shy, but I asked him like, if he could give me some advice on how I could um, like get some breast milk samples. And he just laughed and said, you won't believe this, but we have hundreds of breast milk samples stored in the freezer at the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute. And the only um, thing that I had to be, I would, I would have to do to be able to get access to them was meet with this Harvard professor, also pictured in this image, um, Professor Max Essex. Um, and I remember meeting with him, um, feeling really nervous and, when I knocked on his door, um, he welcomed me in and kissed me on my cheeks and said, you know, have a seat. And um, he asked me three questions, why I was interested in HIV research, what my scientific question was, and how much money I had to do this research. And honestly, that was the start of sort of like my HIV career. Um, we published papers on the breast milk work that we did and um, found that uh, women on antiretroviral therapy were able to suppress their breast milk viral load. Um, and so next slide, please. Following that research project, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a medical doctor or sort of like stay in the, in the realm of sort of like um, lab research. Um, and so I was fortunate enough to get um, a fellowship uh, through the Fogarty Ellison program at the NIH. And this was a program where you got to do clinical research in addition to like laboratory research for a year. And I honestly feel like that was one of the most rewarding experiences of my career. Um, in this picture, you see me sort of like talking about um, early HIV infection and the posters that you see behind me um, with the blue sort of like borders, um, are posters that we designed. Um, and 
like what I want to point out here is sort of like the stuff that I learned, like, you know, being a scientist doesn't mean only, you know, being at a bench and like doing research that way. You can do so many different things. Like with this project, we, we um, had pictures taken. Um, the lady that you see in that picture, like it made me realize, you know, like a slight difference in like a facial expression, you can go from looking scared to looking worried. In this picture, we wanted to convey worried. So if you're worried about recent HIV exposure, come and get this test and, you know, enroll in this study. But I mean, I learned a lot from sort of like, not only sort of like how you, how you prepare messaging for a study. Um, in Botswana, we speak Setswana. And so, you know, translating something from English to Setswana and then back translating it, you could have, you know, slight changes in the meaning of things. And um, it was a really good experience to sort of like really connect with the human side of the work that we do. And I'm sure any scientist you meet will tell you that, you know, like we can do a lot of science, but at the end, end of the day, the most important thing is sort of like the people that you're impacting with the science that you do. Next slide, please. So my journey took me from, from one part of the world to the complete other side of the world, but I have a lot of things in common with Paul on, uh, from Boston and Seattle. And um, next slide, please. Um, a chance meeting at a conference in Budapest is what brought Paul and I together. Um, usually at scientific conferences, you will have sort of like discussions about um, the talks that you've listened to. And um, Paul and I had um, really lively discussions in Budapest and he invited me to come and visit his lab in Seattle, a place that I had not um, had any clue about except from Grey's Anatomy. Um, but I feel like it honestly was one of the best sort of like out of your comfort zone experiences that I ever took that um, had me exposed to so many different things. And I'll switch over to Paul now, who will tell you a little bit about his journey and then we'll share um, some of the interdisciplinary work that we do together. Thank you, Rabia. So uh, I am, Pleased to take over the, the slides now. So yeah, Ra Rabia and, and I met in Budapest and uh, it's kind of random that we met there. I had never been to Budapest before. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, Rabia came to Seattle where I'm actually from. Well, let me, okay. So I grew up in Seattle. Um, I'm pleased to say that my parents are on this call right now. Hi. <laughs> um, we, uh, I grew up in Seattle and I ended up spending some time in Boston where Rabia also spent some time. So we have that in common. Uh, Boston, of course, being not as rainy, but much more snowy. Um, I wanted to, to come back to Seattle and I did. Um, and I'm so pleased to be working right now at the Fred Hutch where we're doing some really awesome work that we're gonna tell you about today. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my journey. Um, so. I went to Seattle Public Schools and I went to Madrona Elementary School. And uh, at Madrona in third grade, I remember there was a poster on the wall of Mr. Hathaway's class, my teacher, that said, end AIDS now. And um, I thought to myself, I hope that by the time I'm a grown up, that is no longer relevant, that we've solved it already. Um, but if not, I want to do that. I want to contribute to that. Um, and around the same time, I read a book that I got from the Madrona Library in third grade. And I think it was this book. I just Googled it. And I think this is it. Um, that really moved me. Um, I was reading about children my own age in another place living with HIV and how HIV impacted them. And I thought, I, I want to do something. And in high school, I uh, had the opportunity to travel to Ghana, which was great. Um, there's a picture there of me dancing with my host family on Independence Day on July 5th. Um, I also participated in some other things in high school that really uh, 
have shaped my my path. So I want to just give a shout out to my teachers. Uh, my neighbor is uh, the the current high school teacher at Garfield High School. Um, but I remember hanging out in Mr. Spang's room, uh, the the biology classroom uh, at Garfield High School, which is a, a public school in Seattle. I, I continued to take classes even after I transferred across the street to the uh, public alternative school called Nova. Um, including Mr. McGowan's amazing marine biology class. Um, at NOVA, we had really just fantastic education, including we had a class on complex systems that inspired me a lot. We read the book Complexity, and uh, I, got, I got the bug. <laughs> um, and uh, meanwhile, I was also working on HIV in the sense of uh, I was participating in community uh, activism about HIV. When I went to Ghana, my host brother was a HIV activist. And at Garfield and Nova, I was the representative for the Teen Health Center. And I was really inspired by that experience. In fact, the, uh, my sister was also inspired by it. My sister's an MD. And she says that that experience of the Garfield Nova Teen Health Center was one of the main inspirations for her. Um, you know, I, I see, and I've seen since high school, complex systems everywhere. Um, when I was in college, I actually created my own major in complex systems, although I didn't actually graduate with that major. I graduated with a computer science major and ended up working at this place called the Institute for Systems Biology in Seattle, largely because it had the name systems on it. My sister was walking by it and said, uh, I noticed that you're opening a new institute called the Institute for Systems Biology. Do you need any programmers? And it was the year 2000 before the crash. And so they did. Um, so I got lucky in that I got to work at this institute that was focused on interdisciplinary biology. And when I was there, I, uh, I was trying to decide what to do with my life. Um, you know, I have computer skills. My parents have statistics backgrounds. So I'd known about statistics, but I'd never taken a statistics class. But this statistician, Andy Siegel, came to the ISB once every week or two. And when he came, the, the halls were abuzz with, you know, Andy's here, Andy's here. And you'd see people lining up and sitting down with him and talking to him. And he would ask them naive questions about their research. You know, tell me, tell me more about that thing. And he would have, he had a pen and he would write mathematical equations and say, is this what you mean? And they would say, thank you so much. And I thought, man, that's what I want to do when I grow up. I want to be Andy. <laughs> I want to do that sort of thing. Um, so I ended up doing statistics, which uh, wasn't on my radar really before that. But it really is a great opportunity to do interdisciplinary research because statistics and computer science, data science in general, they're, they're uh, cross-disciplinary tools. So now here we are at the Hutch, and I have the great pleasure of working with Rabia Rosenkahn and a great team of bioinformaticians and statisticians and biologists, including uh, who you see pictured here, are Danica Shao and uh, Wen Jun Song and Evelina Cosmeter and Rabia and myself. And what we do is we do what Andy did, basically. You know, we sit down with people and we ask them naive questions, or you know, they're less naive because Rabia is there. Um, but we, we get to work on really important and interesting things with math and with um, computers and, and biology. So that's our background and where we are now, I would say now, except for, you know, I'm pretending to be there, but of course I'm working from home. Uh, but the Hutch is a fantastic place to be. It's a beautiful campus. And, you know, another interesting story about myself is that my mom was a faculty member at the Hutch. She's retired now. Uh, but since I was very young, I was going to the Hutch. Um, so I've been to its previous campuses, you know, as a little kid. And uh, here I am. Uh, it's been a year since we've been working from home. So uh, solidarity, <laughs> we're hopeful. Um, but it's a, it's a wonderful place to be. And uh, I think I'll pass now back to Rabia for this. Right. Thank you, Paul. Um, so, so as you can see, Paul and I are from very different places and we think very differently, but 
um, I think there's a lot of strength in sort of like being different and working together. And so the goal of our type of work at Red Hatch is um, to develop new and multidisciplinary approaches to solve complex scientific problems. And we do this by, you know, merging our different expert knowledge. Um, one of the best ways to be able to do this is to be able to listen to each other, um, but also sort of like little things like understanding that the same words may have different meanings. Um, we overcome the language barrier by, you know, feedback talk, which is like sometimes Paul will say something and I'll say, oh, by that, I think you mean this. And he'll say the same thing to me. And so that way we get a deeper understanding of, of how sort of like the problem is viewed from each other's lenses. Um, but I think sort of like critical to this is just really appreciating the differences. Um, next slide, please. Before I continue, I just, I just want to sort of like um, reiterate that, you know, um, in science, it's never one person or two people working together um, to make things happen. It's really like a huge number of people and people you may not always sort of like immediately think of. Um, firstly, like study participants who donate their time and their, and their sort of like willing, willingness to sort of like, you know, be volunteers in some of these trials or biologists and doctors, um, even sort of like postal workers, you know, when you think of a sample getting from you know, a study site to um, a lab testing facility. You know, there's there's a number of people that sort of like are involved in all of the things that we do. Next slide, please. I also wanted to touch on sort of like um, the fact that interdisciplinary work isn't, um, you know, just neat little boxes. Like when we think of STEM, um, and I want to thank Paul for reminding me to add the arts to STEM. Um, but it isn't just, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics sort of like in silos. It's more sort of like what you see at on this bottom panel where things merge and blend together. And um, at this point, I just wanted to touch on sort of like one of our team members, Ewelina, who is so fantastic with sort of like, you know, her creative streak, like, most of the beautiful slides that you see here today are sort of like her sort of like creation of the beautiful things that I have uh, or Paul and I have in our minds. So um, we just wanted to say thank you to Ewelina. Um, next slide, please. Um, so now I'm gonna talk, we're gonna, Paul and I were really thinking about sort of like, what is it that we can convey to you to give you a flavor for the, for the work that we do. So we decided to give um, two specific examples. Um, we work on a number of projects. Um, Paul being a statistician um, gets, uh, I get the opportunity to work on sort of like a wide range of, um, wide range of projects. Um, so one that's, uh, that's very dear to me is um, better estimation of HIV infection time for the AMP trial. So, um, the AMP trial is um, a study that's um, being conducted by the HIV Vaccine Trials Network. Um, we all want a world without HIV, and it takes a lot of work to get there. And um, honestly, the work that the HBTN does, um, having worked um, in Botswana, um, like, you know, the the, the care and consideration they put into like study messaging, into sort of like doing the best science, into sort of like figuring out how we can, we can move things forward is remarkable. Um, so the AMP, the AMP trial um, actually was um, a trial where the idea was to give people antibodies um, that fight HIV to see if this um, can prevent um, a person from being HIV infected. Um, so in this figure, you see um, with no AMP, um, a virus would attach to um, the cell and infect the cell. But if you had sort of like this antibody, um, the theory is that it would bind to, to the virus and prevent infection. Next slide, please. So 
this this study had a number of goals and the goal that we were trying to help with was um, the goal of trying to find out how much antibody, if it protected, how much, what the concentration would be that would provide protection. And to do this, um, finding ways to better estimate when someone was infected would be very helpful. Um, so from this, from this plot, you can see the BRC01 concentration and people are given infusions of this monoclonal antibody um, eight weeks apart with an HIV test in between. And as you can see, the purple and the green represent um, uh, sort of like periods where you could have high concentration of the antibody or a lower concentration of the antibody. And if you know roughly when someone's been infected, you can, you can kind of estimate how much antibody you need to uh, protect a person from being infected. Next slide, please. Um, so this is this is a slightly simplified sort of like image of the work that we do. But in a nutshell, um, what we do is we take diagnostic data, which is data that you would get like if you go to the doctor to get a test to know, let's say, if, if you're if you're HIV infected. And there are different tests that you can take. So they can be tests that, that detect um, the actual presence of the virus. They can be tests that uh, detect um, antibodies that get produced against the virus. And so depending on what tests you use, you can kind of um, sort of like break it down into, into periods of an uh, like an estimate of when you might be infected. Similarly, with sequence data, which is um, the same way um, we have genetic material that makes each of us who we are, um, the virus has genetic materials, but instead of DNA, it's RNA with the, with the virus. Um, you can, you can um, assume that when someone's just been infected, they don't have very many mutations. And as the infection progresses, they accumulate mutations. And if you count those mutations, then you know roughly how much time has passed since the person was infected. So what we do is we take these two streams of data and we use statistical methods to combine them to try and get um, the best estimate. Next slide, please. This is just a slide from one of our scientific talks that sort of like gives you an idea. So from the diagnostic data, um, we get a little calendar with like the light blue representing less probable days of infection, whereas the dark blue says it's more likely to have happened in this period. And so from the diagnostic data, the sequence data, combining the two, we can, we can pinpoint more accurately when someone was infected. Um, next slide, please. So this slide has a lot of words on it, and I don't, I don't need us to focus on the words, but more sort of like the fact that Paul comes with um, a certain type of knowledge, and I come with a certain type of knowledge, and then we've got overlap in the type of uh, knowledge that we have, and so really collaborating and working together to solve these types of problems um, involves sort of like information of information flow and overlap. And so really trying to find ways to communicate with each other, our ideas and our ways of approaching the problem really go a long way to um, finding solutions. So now I'm gonna let Paul um, give you a different example and then we can have a chat about um, anything that people wanna know about. All right, so you are probably aware that there is a big effort underway to develop vaccines against coronavirus, and uh, that's also what we do at the Hatch. So the Fred Hatch is the headquarters of the HIV vaccine trials network. It's incidentally also where the statistical group is for other HIV prevention networks, and. It is now also the headquarters of the Coronavirus Prevention Network, which is uh, designing and conducting the studies that you've heard about, including uh, the Johnson & Johnson study that was 
uh, recently reported and, and has led to the FDA's emergency use authorization for the single dose vaccine. So um, we, Rabia and I, are part of the coronavirus prevention network and have been participating in conversations about these trials for the last year. We're now actually involved in designing coronavirus trials and um, our, our interaction is not just with the COVPN, we're working with people in other countries who are also designing these trials, including in South Africa and in England to uh, employ these same approaches that we were talking about. So for instance, one of the key questions that's come up is can we measure the efficacy of a vaccine against onward transmission? And so for this, we work with sequence analysis and also with epidemiological data and um, talk to a lot of experts who know more than we do about those things in figuring out, can we uh, design a clinical trial to estimate those things? And, and we are, <laughs> it's pretty exciting. Um, and I just will take this moment to say, since the slide is here and showing this to you, that you, you may be aware that it's been a very fast, it's an astonishingly fast timeline that we've gone from characterizing this virus to being able to be vaccinated. Um, and that is in part because we had already had uh, a lot of work done in place through the HIV work mostly but really through the work of people like Rabia and people all over the world who've been working for years on how to develop vaccines against HIV and other pathogens. So for HIV, we have modest efficacy only of our vaccines. We've not been able to yet devise a vaccine that really is preventative. But as you can see, the coronavirus vaccine is very astonishingly successful. And you know that is a lot of applied research that was developed through the work, um, actually largely through the work on HIV. The SARS-1 virus had been um, circulating before SARS-2 and people had developed vaccines. So they were available, so that helped. Um, having seen the whole process from the inside, I can tell you that there's no shortcuts that were taken. You know, the process has been solid. It has been uh, intense and we've been working hard and our colleagues have been working very, very hard to get uh, these vaccine trials designed and, and conducted. And we've been lucky because the vaccines work really well and they've been pretty easy to show that they work really well. So, yeah. Well, can you um, just kind of clarify what efficacy means? Oh, sorry. Yes, we use these words. And thank you for asking. This is a perfect example of how we in scientific communities use words that have special meaning. And the word efficacy has a special meaning for vaccine scientists. So efficacy is how you measure in a clinical trial setting how well a vaccine is working. And when we're communicating with each other as scientists, we are very careful to differentiate these words because the word efficacy means something different than the word effectiveness. Effectiveness is what happens when you vaccinate a population and you measure how much reduction in disease or infection have you accomplished. But efficacy is a measure in a vaccine trial setting of the difference in the disease outcome or the infection outcome across the groups. So when we talk about the efficacy of the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines being very high, what we mean is that in these studies with tens of thousands of people randomized to be either receiving that vaccine or a placebo, who don't know whether they've received the placebo or the vaccine, we can see in the data, you know, it's astonishing, it's beautiful that after vaccinating people, they don't get the disease anymore. It takes about seven days to really see the signal and it's really strong. And by the second dose, after two weeks after the second dose, these are highly efficacious vaccines, meaning you can see that there's a big difference in the outcomes across those groups. Thanks for that question, Jean. So I wanna say that the same sorts of interactions 
are happening all the time about coronavirus and about everything. Um, so the same sorts of questions that Robbie and I have been addressing for many years about analyzing sequence data and how that could inform HIV vaccine trials are now really important for coronavirus vaccine trials. As you may be aware, there are variants of concern that are circulating and um, our group is you know, attuned to the particular problem of how do you measure vaccine efficacy as it varies across the different virus variants. And in particular, what, what um, our group does is, and I say our group meaning I am embedded in a larger group of, of people. Rabia and I are embedded in a group of statisticians who design these trials. And the goal in part is to estimate what correlate of efficacy we can identify that will allow us to quickly develop new vaccines for different variants as they emerge. So this is a big effort that we call correlates analysis and sieve analysis. And the idea of correlates analysis is that there's probably something that you can measure after you vaccinate someone that will tell you whether the vaccine is working for that person. And when I say probably there is, I, one hopes that there is. In this case, there probably is. And we think it's probably the neutralizing antibody response. So if we can measure that the vaccine is generating in you a response against coronavirus, we might be able to tell you, yeah, you are protected. You will be protected now. And if we can do that, then we can develop new vaccines without even having to conduct big phase three trials. That is, we still have to show that the vaccines are safe, but in order to show that they're effective, rather than having to do a huge trial with tens of thousands of people as we've been doing, we will be able to bridge the vaccine efficacy using the correlate. So as we are developing new variant vaccines, as you may or may not know, the, um, the, the coronavirus vaccine prevention network that we're part of is already uh, getting trials into the field with the new variant uh, targeted. So, so Moderna and other companies have been developing versions of the vaccine that can target the new variants. And eventually those studies will not be placebo controlled. That is, we'll be, we will not randomize people to receive this vaccine or no vaccine, because if there's a good vaccine, that's not ethical and it's not appropriate. Everyone should get a good vaccine if there's a good vaccine. But what we can do is we can measure that the immune response to that vaccine is likely to be protective against the new variant and license it on that basis. So that's um, the summary of the example too. And I suspect you will have questions and I'm here and Robbie is here to answer those questions. I just wanna conclude by saying thank you, especially thank you Jeannie for organizing this. Thank you for the teachers out there who are participating in this. Awesome, <laughs> thank you, keep up the good work. It's because of you that we're here. Um, and my parents, thank you. And uh, I'd also like to thank the Hutch staff who have helped uh, organize this education program and make this possible. Uh, and with that, I conclude, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, if uh, people would like to um, throw up a reaction or something in the chat to say, to say thank you to the presenters, that would be wonderful. And we also would love to um, hear your questions at this time, especially the teachers and students who are here, but um, we can also take questions from, from others. Um, and you can either uh, raise your hand um, with the raise hand feature, or you can um, put your questions in the chat. And so uh, we'll, we'll wait a moment to, to see how um, the questions shape up here. Especially the, you know, given all the work that you're doing with COVID, I imagine that there's some questions related to that. And also thank you for the, the um, examples of your collaboration. Um, I think those are both, both really interesting ones. All right.
I used to do a lot of teaching and it's been a while, but one of the things that we learned is that you have to, you have to tolerate the silence when you ask a question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but we, we're okay if there are no questions. Can you, oh, can you um, clarify a little bit about um, some of the distinctions between uh, the vaccine preventing you from getting sick in the first place versus, you know, um, onset of, of disease and how people might be confusing what actually is happening with the vaccine and where we are with that. That's a point I've always kind of wondered about. I could address that. Uh, so, um, yeah, so the, so HIV vaccine trials are typically uh, against infection. That is what we're trying to prevent is infection. And in the context of the coronavirus trials, we usually don't measure that. It's hard to measure infection because people, for the most part, who get coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, don't know that they have it. Uh, and so if you want to capture infection, you need to do a study where you are proactively looking for it. So we are designing a study right now which will proactively look for infections by having participants self swab their nose twice a week and those will be evaluated for coronavirus. Um, those are on the setting of a college campus where there's active testing on college, some college campuses. And so we're utilizing that as a resource. In many settings, it's just very logistically hard to measure infection. And so instead what we measure is symptomatic infection. So the Johnson & Johnson primary data are, they call it moderate and severe disease, which is effectively symptomatic infection. So people who feel sick enough to go get tested and then are tested positive, and then also have symptoms that is, it's even possible to go get a coronavirus test and have it be positive and never have had any symptoms because maybe you wouldn't got it because someone told you that they had it and they exposed you. The Johnson & Johnson primary endpoints, if I understand correctly, are symptomatic infection. And mostly the endpoints are symptomatic infection, which means that what we know, what we can know from those trials is that they're very good at preventing severe disease and hospitalization and pretty pretty darn good at preventing any symptomatic infection. It's pretty astonishing how good they are. I mean, it's really astonishing how good they are. That is, to my knowledge, no one in any of the three trials for Pfizer, Moderna, or Johnson & Johnson who received the vaccine died of coronavirus. None of them, no one. Yeah, that's um, amazing. It's amazing. It's really effective, but we don't know whether that is preventing infection. And we have some reason to think it's not. Um, but, uh, so I hope that answered your question. Yeah, we have a couple more questions in the chat now. Um, when you help design trials, do the companies have to take your advice on trial design? Good question. That's a wonderful question. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to speak more than I know, but what I know, uh, is I think this, which is that for these, for these studies, in some cases, we didn't in we didn't design the study at all so in the in the case of pfizer they wanted to run the study themselves and so they did but we arranged that we would access samples for correlates analysis and we had a lot of um, input in the process to help define the endpoints and also to help define when we would get those samples that is when when they would be collected so uh, I see a question, when will a vaccine for children be available? So I'm gonna simultaneously answer that one, which is that um, this correlates is key to developing vaccines for children. If we can identify that a certain antibody response is protective, we could uh, develop a vaccine for younger children without having to show a full efficacy trials worth of data. We could show that it's safe and that they have a, a good enough response that it's effective. And in order to do that, what we need is the, is the samples. 
And it's sort of a, a weird, funny situation to be in that there's so few people who actually got sick after getting the vaccine that we know about because there were probably infections that were not detected. But in terms of symptomatic infections, there's so few that we actually have a, a paucity of data to do the correlates analysis. I mean, pooling together the data from the studies, we're able to do it. But we needed to ask that Pfizer help with that, and they did. Um, Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, my understanding is that our involvement is much uh, more in terms of helping design those studies. It's complicated and I don't understand the, the details, but Ensemble 1 and Ensemble 2 are the two Johnson & Johnson studies for the single dose and two dose. And the uh, Coronavirus Prevention Network has been involved in the first of those, but not the second of those. So I think that there has been some times when we've hoped for more um, coming together on what exactly the endpoints would be. So for instance, the Johnson & Johnson definition of moderate and severe disease is slightly different than what is being used in another study. And you know sometimes that can cause us some challenges, but the Operation Warp Speed, which is a funny name for what this is, uh, the go US government effort to produce, to, to do the trials and produce enough vaccine in time um, has been called Operation Warp Speed. And um, Operation Warp Speed has a lot of leverage and has been able to, to work with the companies and they've been cooperating, cooperating as far as I understand. We have a, a number. Of, so did, did you say when will a vaccine for children be available? When do you I didn't, think? I didn't say when because <laughs> I'm loath to say it. You know, my sister and I talk about this. You know, we know that there's studies underway, studies underway in, I, I, I'm, I hope I don't misspeak, but I think in, in children as young as 12 now, there's a study started. But um, I don't believe that any studies are being planned for below 12 efficacy studies. So I, I think that the plan has to be and is that we will use a correlate strategy to bridge to young people. And I think that the timeline for that is not clear, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't guess that it would be this summer or maybe it, you know, not even this fall. Maybe um, this, we have a few questions from students that I can throw to Rabia. Rabia, um, there, there's a question about um, what was challenging bec during becoming a scientist and how would you describe your usual work environment, environment as a virologist? That's a good question. Um, so Kao, um, I would say sort of like the biggest challenge was, um, you know how like in the movies you see a scientist doing an experiment and it's like, Eureka, we found the solution so quickly. Um, in real life science, um, you'll have a lot of failures before you have successes and you have to be, you have to be okay with those. Um, like, like, Science is, science is not always just super easy. Um, and um, I guess, I guess you learn, like, I guess maybe one of the most challenging things is sort of like having patience during those times. Um, and sort of like, what does our work environment look like? Um, right now for the past year, it's um, a lot of Zoom calls, mm -hmm. um, reading a lot of papers, um, trying to keep up not only with HIV, TB and all of the other work that we do, but COVID as well. And um, as Paul mentioned, you know, the COVID sort of like landscape changes sort of like so rapidly. So you really have to sort of like have fire for what you're doing. So if if science is what you love, um, when you're going to sort of like pick a project that you're going to work on, find something that, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you really enjoy doing it because as scientists, you sort of like live and breathe the work that you do. I hope those responses answer the question. Uh, um, Paul, do you have anything to add about your usual work environment as a statistician? Like what's that <laughs> work kind of like day to day? Yeah, well, I was thinking about how Rabia used to be a lab scientist, and you know, part of part of the transition to working with with us here is that you're not doing that anymore, Rabia. And um, and I think that was a welcome change for you, as you said it. But you know, I think for a lot of people, it would be an unwelcome change to to not be in the lab. It um, 
there's plenty of labs at the hutch. So a lot of people do have labs, including a lot of um, data science type people, but we don't. So because of that, because we don't have a wet lab, we have been able to work remotely even before the pandemic. And I tend to work from coffee shops, you know. Um, so we meet in person and we meet online and uh, we work on our own on computers uh, because we're mostly doing in silico sort of work. So, you know, looking at genome sequences and things like that. Yeah. Uh, and as far as like the, it, the environment's very social, you know, it, it's actually what we do is, is mostly talk to people. And uh, we have calls with, with highly interdisciplinary groups to organize trials. So for example, this coronavirus trial that we're working on, the people who are part of the leadership team involve expertises in all these realms, including community members are always part of the leadership teams of our, of our trials. Um, so it's a lot of talking and a lot of discussing things like ethics, you know, we, we take ethics very seriously and we're all like highly trained in it. And so we talk to each other a lot about what operational constraints there should be in trials and how are we going to do this? And uh, it's, just, it's uh, the day-to-day -day work it is not as much math as you might expect, um, but it does involve a lot of programming and thinking mathematically too. Good, thank you. And um, just for, for students who are thinking that they want to be involved in research facilities um, when they're older, what can they be thinking about or doing to prepare now? I, I can, yeah, I can say, I can say something. I think that for me, it was um, talking to people. Like, don't be afraid to reach out and sort of like, ask if you can come and sort of like volunteer for a little while at a lab, um, you know, sort of like help out on a project. Um, a lot of times sort of like um, just shooting someone an email or when you meet someone somewhere like Paul and I met at a conference in Budapest. So just don't be afraid to have conversations to, um, to engage with people. So I think um, that's probably sort of like one of the main things. And then sort of like read up on, you know, like when you're younger, you think that there's only this or that as like a certain profession, but there's like there's like a whole spectrum of things you could be doing. Um, I know uh, people who studied mathematics who are now modeling infectious disease. I know people who, um, who whose job it is to um, engage with the community and educate them about, you know, certain vaccine trials. So there's like, there's like a range of things that you could be doing. Um, Google is your friend. Um, scientists that you meet are your friend. Um, even with the pandemic, um, look at the opportunities that we have to engage and speak with each other. So um, yeah, just sort of like step out of your comfort zone and, and talk to people. <laughs> and one thing that Paul mentioned, you know, the distinction between wet lab and dry lab, which is um, kind of a distinction between mostly computer based versus the kind of wet lab is where you kind of imagine people are, you know, pouring liquids and pipetting and things like that. And in reality, a lot of labs are blended too. Um, but if you're working in statistics or math or um, other areas um, like that, Sometimes the students can come in at a younger age. The wet labs have uh, uh, usually an age requirement. And so that might also be something to consider that um, you might be able to, to work with somebody uh, earlier in your, in your uh, trajectory as a high school student, um, if you're interested in some of the, the more mathematical parts of it or computational parts. I might want to just speak to, I see a couple of questions here about I'm, you know, I'm a student and what can I do to prepare and what are the challenges? So in terms of what can you do to prepare, I think that the, the advice about reaching beyond your comfort zone and, and sort of letting your, sticking your neck out a little bit, you know, taking some brave moments and say, you know, reach cold calling, cold emailing, 
a scientist and saying, hey, I'm a student and I want to work with you, you know, sometimes people are busy and they can't respond, but we love that sort of thing. You know, it's really great. It's great to get contacted by young people who are interested. I, I want to say a few things. One is that you don't need to have started early, you know, so you could do an internship in high school, I think. But if you don't, I, you know, it's not like you'll be set back. But I do think that in high school, you can do a lot to be better prepared and that mostly that age is a great time to really broaden your horizons as far as communication um, and as far as your tools so you know it's a great time to learn to program for instance um, or to take up an interest and learn you know learn things on online or in classes um, because uh it's a it's even even those successful people who really were much less multidisciplinary than than we are are really multidisciplinary so i mean i think just just tooling up in every realm being excited and interested and in, and in asking questions about the things that interest you is the foundation i think that you need in terms of challenges there's always challenges you know there's challenges throughout life and uh i think Rabia can speak to some interesting, unique challenges that happen when you're in a resource limited setting as a scientist, when the reagents aren't as available, things like that. I think there's challenges that we face because our society has structural racism and structural uh, inequities of all kinds. And those are challenges that we've all faced and some of us less than others, more than others. Um, and you will face those, we will all face those. And I think, you know, it's also a good time for that in the sense that there's an awareness now that's increasing and generally about that has to be addressed. But I would say that most scientists that you ask would answer that they have had challenges and those challenges have been resource sorts of challenges and they've been personal challenges. I think deciding to become a scientist feels like deciding not to become something else. But another thing I just wanna say is that the, the path that you take in life can go through science and end up somewhere else. Um, and that other place could be also wonderful. And really the foundation that you get by investing in the things that lead to science um, also are great foundations for, for life and for other things. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and to be persistent too, right? Like if you're the first person you meet doesn't have room in their lab or can't take you right now, just to kind of keep asking and keep, keep after it. Um, great, great advice and great thoughts. So thank you so much, uh, the both of you. And I'm going to um, throw up, this is a uh, uh, QR code for our evaluation. It's just a couple questions. Um, so this is, uh, if you have a moment to give us some feedback. Um, I've also pasted the link into the chat. Um, and we'd just love to hear, you know, what you thought of the talk and of this of this uh, event today. So if you have a moment um, to give us some feedback, that'd be great. Um, I wanted to let you know that uh, recordings and schedule are linked at the Science Education Partnership events page. Uh, we have virtual field trips and other spe speaker series featured there. That's also where you can go to register for upcoming events, like the next virtual field trip in March. We're going to Stanley Lee's lab, and um, Stanley Lee's lab studies the molecular basis of blood cell development and how, when that goes wrong, can lead to some um, leukemias and associated symptoms. So it'll be um, focused on, on blood cancers in particular and kind of the, the work that they do in that lab. So um, you can pre-register as I mentioned and you can also if you sign up for the newsletter you'll hear about upcoming things um, such as these talks. And usually we've been doing one talk and one vir virtual tour per month um, and that's been kind of our, our cadence with that. So um, with that, I will uh, wrap it up. Uh, feel free to turn on your video, unmute yourself, uh, throw up a reaction or, or put something in the chat uh, to thank our speakers today um, for this wonderful presentation and um, show them some, some appreciation.